Steve Nash is here. Um, he's in to do something else that we haven't announced yet, but we finished that, and now we're going to talk quickly about where basketball is going in 2020 with everybody just switching teams every year now. And you were a very loyal guy. You you switched once from the Mavs to the Suns and you didn't even really want to do that. Then you stayed with the Suns forever and then you finally went to the Lakers near the tail end of your career. But you were really loyal to the cities and the and the teammates, all that stuff. And something has shifted this decade. And I don't think it's a good thing or a bad thing. It's just the way it's changed now. When you look at what basketball is like now, what do you think? I guess the way I look at it is it's like this evolution and it's just this cycle and the players are realizing how important they are um, to yeah. the business and are flexing on it and saying, like, I really do have more power. Whereas I think the generation, the generational shift, every generation, the way kids are growing up nowadays, like it, it, it's almost like anything's available, anything's on the table. Whereas when, you know, when I was growing up, it was like, how dare you? Yeah. You know, how dare you like say that? Like, you know, when I, you know, it was, that was one of the things when I went from, when I went from Dallas to Phoenix and Phoenix to LA, Dallas and Phoenix were both done with me. You know, like they would have kept me on for cheap, but they didn't value me going forward as a, a piece of the franchise um, that I was, I was at. So, you know, in a sense, I was forced to like show my value and move on to, right. you know, to where I thought I was still valued and wanted and an important part. So, you know, but that, that was, those were tricky times. Cause I wasn't like, you know, Oh hell yeah, I'm out of here. I was like, really? Can't we find a way? Yeah. Like, can't we, you know, could we do this? Could we do that? And when it was just apparent that it wasn't going to happen and then golf between how much I was wanted somewhere else and where I was, you know, it was too big. You had to go, but it was like the decision was made for me. Nowadays, I think we're at a place, and and rightfully so, that the players are saying, you know, how many lockouts have we had where the owners make the players look like, you know, fools and just hold out, and they know that one of the four hundred guys is going to make us look bad, and we'll splinter and we'll wait, and you know, we're in an era now where I think one, the players are showing that more power, more sophistication, um, but we're also showing we have a commissioner that is as a has, has great foresight and is riding the line between allowing this to go on and seeing where it goes and at the same time avoiding um, big problems in, in collective bargaining. So I do think there will be some sort of correction I I at some point, uh, but I don't think we're there yet to decide, okay, this has gone too far. We got to correct this. And I think Adam's outstanding because he wants player power. He wants players yeah. to be global icons. He wants them to to have a voice in the community. All these things that I think make the NBA unique and, and powerful. And at the same time, you know, it, I, he's also watching it closely to make sure that like, yeah, the owners are happy, but what is the perception of the fans? Where is the game at its greatest? Where can we keep this thing growing? Because it's, it's in a great trajectory, trajectory right now. If I had told you KD was only going to be with the Warriors for three years, three years ago, would you have believed that? I, I wouldn't have not believed it. I think I would have thought he would have had such a great experience there that he wouldn't yeah. want to leave. Um, so that that would be the surprise in it. But You mean like just winning I every did. year? <laughs> <laughs> Playing with the best players in the league? You would have thought that would have been enticing? Yeah, sort of. Um, Make a lot of money? You know, but like, you know, Kevin's a... Kevin's, he's a thoughtful, um, I don't, I don't want to say complicated, he's sophisticated. He, you know, he, he, he definitely, I think is certain, he's continually pushing himself and searching for whatever it is out there that's going to fulfill him and excite him. And so I think maybe that part of was underestimated that he would leave in three years because, because that was what led him there in the first place. Right. It was yep. that he wanted something Curiosity. higher, bigger. He wanted to experience something new. He wanted to be pushed in new ways. And it's kind of the same thing that's happening now. Did you, you buy the whole narrative that once you join the Warriors and you think this, this will be great. I'm going to prove I'm the best player in the league. I'm going to beat LeBron in a final mm. series and whatever. And then slowly realize this is Steph Curry's city. This is Steph Curry's team. I'm kind of the sidekick for mm. lack of a better word. Mm. Do you think that bothered him or is that an overthink? Because it I, is Steph Curry's city. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I think that plays a role. I don't think it's everything. 
for Kevin. I think it's probably overplayed yeah. by the media. Uh, I think in some ways Kevin just wanted to change, mm. you know, and I like that's not all of it, but I think that's a big enough portion of it that he wanted a new challenge, a new environment and similar to when he left OKC. You know, yeah. that's just, I think like him constantly seeking maybe a new challenge and a new opportunity, new experience. He's, he's, you know, there's a lot of layers to him and I think he, he loves to explore. Cause you played with, you had Marion and Stoudemire together mm -hmm. in Phoenix. Yeah. Complicated guys. Sure. And Marion was the guy who was in kind of that Chris Bosch in Miami role of right. the thankless yeah. third star who's doing all the dirty work and he's got his friends telling him. Yeah. You'd be the best player if you were on this team or whatever. Yeah. And he but the best thing for him to do to win with you is to put up eighteen and ten a game, guard the other team's best player mm -hmm. and not do too much. Right. And you had to navigate that as the leader of the team basically for the entire mid two thousands. Do we underestimate the mechanics of a basketball team as fans and as media people, like just the day to day personalities? Cause it does seem like with the Warriors, that was one of the things that drifted south a little bit. You would have thought Durant, Curry, Draymond, Clay, it would just be like, oh my God, right. can you believe we're all playing together? But basketball teams are complicated. Yeah. And weird stuff starts to happen. Do you do you feel like it's just hard to have a peaceful team for that long? Yeah, it's a challenge. I mean, like, here's a here's a how about this for an anecdote? Like uh you know, all these guys are now like exploring business opportunities away from right. the court. But how many of them are partnering on business opportunities? That's a good point. Like they, think of they that. could think about how powerful they could right. be if they teamed up, but they want their name on the door because they have to share the name on the front, right? Like they share that in Marina. Now they want to build their own thing individually. So I think that's a tricky thing. They, they're human. They want to prove that they can expand and, and do different things and show diversity and, and show that they're talented beyond just basketball. And so in some ways you're getting pushed to do by the culture to do that and stand out from an off the court perspective. And at the same time, you're, you know, you're trying to put a basketball team together. So I, I think that that's, you know, one of those things that we're going through a cycle where players. So those two know, things are a little bit at odds. They're a little, yeah. I mean, I, I don't even, they're at odds you know, conceptually, but I don't even know that they're directly at odds. It just is an interesting mirror of like what player, what the culture is kind of like, I, I wonder how many of these guys are, are trying to build business off the court because everyone else is. It's, I would say like a few. Instead of just like, no, I really love this and I want to do this. It's like the obligatory, I got to do this. Um, because the amount of money some of the, some of the guys are making nowadays, you know, how many days do you have to give away with external stuff to make five, ten percent of what you're making annually, anyways, may pos maybe, and maybe making nothing. Um, so I think there it, it, it's an interesting era. I love player empowerment. I think that we're going through this period where the boundaries are getting pushed, um, but at the same time, I think it's cyclical, and we'll come back to a place that might not be like it was. You know, uh, twenty. You know years who ago? started all this off the court bullshit? Guy from Canada by the name of Steve Nash. <laughs> I remember way back in the day before anyone was thinking this way, somebody got his hands in a 30 for 30, I, I did got, a little finish line documentary for Grantland, was doing a production company. You, you're, you're patient zero for this. <laughs> I was, I was you lucky, don't get, you I don't was get lucky blamed. You, you gave me a, my first film. So yeah. I, but when you were doing that, everybody was like, right. Steve Nash is going to produce a 30 for 30. Like they were like right. dumbfounded by it. Now, if we, if we were launching 30 for 30 now, You'd we would have, have every athlete. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> every athlete would be someone. like, Hey, I just formed a company. <laughs> <laughs> Can I do one? <laughs> but also just the way like content is nowadays, there's so much content. Yeah. If you're trying to get someone off the ground, you got to attach a celebrity to it, whether it's an actor, a producer, an artist, or an athlete, you know, it's almost, it's almost laughable, right? Yeah. How many, like, oh, you got an EP credit on that. People still ask me what happened to the last episode of the finish line. And I was like, what happened is Steve Nash's basketball career was actually like really ending. Yeah. And he, it suddenly became not as fun to do a documentary series about yeah, it. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, and, and, and we also, you know, in my perspective, I'm not saying this is the wrong, we shot a ton that we never made it in. Yeah. And I think we'd shot so much that the exhaustion, um, I don't, I, I don't, I think the series ended up great in the way it was Me edited too. and picked. I wouldn't take that. It was that, way ahead of its I, time. I, it, was, it was. I'm really proud. It's one of the things I'm the most proud of from that girl whole Grantland era, especially because I remember you were initially going to do a documentary and then we talked about it and talked about it. Yeah. And we thought to capture it in the moment would be cooler. And it, was, it really was like, there was nothing like that. It was funny because you had always pushed me to write a book. 
Yeah. And and when I called you to do this, you were like, this is your book. Let's do yeah. It. And um, so I was grateful to do it. But where I'm, I'm frustrated is that I didn't double down and make that my model and do a bunch of content like that. I kept thinking more like, how do I get into this, you know, linear conversation more and TV and all that. And that was not wise. I think that was my sweet spot, especially at the time. That you, that was the last Lakers playoff season. Oh, yeah. So you have that. Yeah. Um, Dwight Howard was there. Now he's back with the Lakers. Amazing, right? Did you? Uh, was, what were the odds of that in 2013? I, yeah, it took me a minute. I was like, oh yeah, Dwight's in the Lakers. Then I thought, hold, hold on a minute. I was with Dwight on the Lakers. <laughs> right. that, that you had the end. iconic SI cover. Yeah, that didn't end well, yeah. Yeah. Um, were you surprised to see him come back? I was. I mean, that didn't did not end well. And, uh, you know, but in today's NBA, are you, is, are you surprised of anything? I mean, the stranger things have happened. You know, this whole thing now where the guys are teaming up and the new mm. team and Katie and Kyrie in Brooklyn and just, this is now the thing every year, but people are acting like this wasn't happening before. Like this, you know, the, I think sure. the 2012 Lakers were a good example. You and Howard are on that SI cover yeah. and it's you guys and Kobe and Gasol. And then four, you know, eight years earlier, basically the same thing happened with Peyton and Malone and Shaq and yeah. Kobe. And this was happening. KG and sure. Ray Allen and Paul Pierce. I mean, you, it, even like, it, it, like, Kobe, Artest, Bynum, Gasol. That's a pretty good, <laughs> right. pretty good team, right? Um, you know, so like you, you there, there's been these teams that maybe didn't quite have like I don't know if it was the moment that made it look like a super team, but it's been going. Look at the old Lakers and Celtics teams. I mean, those were super teams. So. If you had been healthy that year, hmm. let's say you were 2010 Nash instead of 2012 Nash. Would that Lakers team have actually been good or was that too weird of a team? Uh, so what did we do? We made the playoffs, lost in the first round of the Spurs. It's just, you had Kobe yeah. who had never right. really played uh, with a point guard like look, that. I, I don't think it was It was a great fit. It was a great idea. It was a great opportunity. You know, I think everyone thought, you know, this this will happen. This will be great. But then when it started happening, I mean, a lot of factors. One, you know, my I broke my knee in the first, second game, whatever it was. I was never the same. I'm still not the same from that. Just with What my, was that one? Broken kneecap? I broke the tib fib joint uh, on, my, on my knee in my first or second game with the Lakers. And it was inside the joint where it articulates. And with my back problem, there's a theory in neuropathy. Okay, everyone just go to take a quick nap here. But called a double crush. So I have, I have you know, let's say uh, unsymptomatic, non-symptomatic nerve problems in my back with all my other back issues then this nerve right running through that joint you have two it's called a, a double crush and so i'm i've honestly since that break i've never my body's different just the way it, it responds to everything so there's that i wasn't quite the same wasn't moving great forevermore you know pow i think was going through a stretch where he was exhausted from yeah. playing for spain all three right. summers um and you know, Dwight, Dwight Dwight's came body off the was back break surgery. Down. Yeah. Um, I don't think uh, Meta was quite the same, you know, uh, although he could still, you know, hurt people and, and still had his moments. He wasn't quite as dynamic as he was. And I don't think we fit great. You know, yeah. like I, Dwight was at a moment in his career where he really wanted to post up. And, you know, whereas what would suit our team is a high pick and roll and Dwight rolling to the basket and you got all these other guys around. You weren't showing him Amari pick and rolls on yeah, your phone? Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> look at this, watch this. You know, I think, hey, I I think Mike this. actually did a little bit, but I, th I think he really was at a moment where he wanted to prove, and I don't know if his back, he didn't want to move around that much or what, but he wanted to prove that he could, you know, play in the post. The unfortunate thing is it, it was just getting to that era where teams could just cheat in and out of the paint enough that it made it hard. Um, anyways, you add it all up. I don't know that it would have ever worked. Um, you know, it it just it was doomed. What was Kobe like at that point in his career? You know, he I mean, he had a great year the year he, yeah. he hurt his Achilles. I think coming out of the Olympics, an Olympics where he was not moving well, and I think was it the OKC series the year before, like yeah. before the Olympics, where he was not moving well, not moving well in the Olympics, and then he comes back that season, and it's like he's he's ten years younger, and yeah. he's he's physically was outstanding, and then he tore the Achilles, and so, um, you know, he but he he was playing great at a super high level. Uh, but it, it just the pieces, you know, it was such a, a lot of old dogs, new tricks. And, you know, we already talked about how temperamental chemistry is in a basketball team in particular of all the sports in a sense, you know, yeah. that balance. And so, uh, you know, looking back on it now, I'm not sure it would have ever worked. You played with Kobe, you played with Shaq, you played with Stoudemire and you played with Dirk and you played with Jason Kidd. Who am I leaving out? 
You uh, played that, with five of the top, of the best levels, ten yeah. guys of the last twenty five years somehow, yeah. or maybe the best twelve. I don't know. I'd have to see the whole yeah. list, but it's kind of weird. It is but weird. you caught Shaq at a weird point yeah. in his career. You caught Kobe at a weird right. point. Even Dwight was the best center of the two thousands yeah, after Shaq. I mean, Dwight. You know, we forget a little bit how good he was because ever since that back yeah. surgery, never nothing went right for him. Uh, he was unbelievable before that. Um, yeah, I got to play, you know, I just didn't get to play them at the right time and they didn't get to play with me at the right time. Um, Tottenham, really quick. Mm. Have you recovered? You know, it's not been very fun this first few weeks of the season. You know, I don't, the mechanism of that European transfer, those Premier League, you can't make any transfers after, say, August 9th and the rest of Europe can transfer until September 2nd. And so Christian Eriksen, like our one of our very, very best players, but also our best, most irreplaceable playmaker because a lot of the teams sit back and just defend the whole game. And he's yeah. the one guy that's just brilliant at pulling teams apart. Um, you know, he he's said after the Champions League that he wanted to, I think he wanted to go to Madrid, but it doesn't look like Madrid's coming in for him, but he's waiting to see if someone will come. And so and there's a few players like that in our team that are, it's un, the whole thing's unsettled. So, um so it's been an uncomfortable start to the season. Having said that, if you had asked me two or three weeks before the Champions League final if if Tottenham would ever make a Champions League final if I lived to be 90, I'd probably said no, not a chance. So to get there was like a gift and a dream and an unbelievable experience. Um, so I, And, and so you had to do television. It was my one, my first year in studio. I can't believe that happened. I mean, it, was just, it was unbelievable. And the way they beat City in that crazy game, yeah. doubleheader, and then... The uh, the home and away with Ajax. I mean, it was it was unbelievable. And then, ironically, the final was a dud. You know, so uh, my only experience that's even relatively similar to that, just being on live TV when something super personal is happening to you, <laughs> is I was doing the NBA draft for ESPN the day they traded Pearson Garnett, and wow. they just dumped them, and we didn't know what the picks were. How'd you respond? I basically am like just dying on television because it seemed like they took Gerald Wallace's contract back and we got like two picks back. Didn't know about the pick swap. Right. And I'm just like, and they're like, Bill, what are you thinking? I'm, and I'm thinking like, <laughs> Paul Pierce has been on our team for 15 years. What's going on? I thought he was going to retire with us. Yeah. Like I just, and I didn't like the trade. Yeah. And then uh, it's intense. It, it, it was, TV. I, well, yeah, I it cried. Was hard. I don't know if you, I remember that we, when they scored, uh, I went sprinting out the door. It ran yeah. like for two minutes straight around this studio in Burbank. I came back in. I didn't mean to. I didn't, you know, it just hits you. And I come back in and I'm tearing up. And like, obviously they People caught love it. that though. The, people caught it. And, and uh, but it's a weird thing. Then you got to go and talk about it. You know, like you're like, I'm, you're just, I don't even know where I am. Like I, <laughs> like I'm, I'm literally gone. Like I'm so gone. This goes back to like, my first word was goal. My dad's from my mom and dad from Tottenham. My yeah. grandparents, like my dad grew up going to games, running to the stadium. I remember waking up on the West coast of Canada five in the morning as whenever Tottenham was on my whole childhood, like it's your fabric of me, my dad, my brother, my cousins, like all these things that comes out of you, you don't even know are there. And then you're on TV. Like <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing to say right now. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the, the champions, the final, the classic, terrible goal in the first uh, the penalty, 90 seconds. Very which unfortunate. Is my least favorite thing about soccer, mm -hmm. having being a sports parent, that those games when you just kind of go, oh, this yeah. is going to be one of these games where we're, we're down one nothing on the dumbest goal ever. Yeah. And now it's going to, we're going to hit right. a crossbar. Right. They're going to get gonna, one chance. My dad yeah. always said, as a kid, oh, that's, that's the worst. My dad always said, that's football. You know, you dominate, they get one chance, you lose. And then they move everyone back. They're playing kickball. Yeah, right. And you're just like, oh, really? Right. We're going to have to do this. And, yeah. Yeah. And that's the game. And, 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 well, one of the things that made last year's Champions League fantastic was the away goals because it forces teams to go for it. Right? Yeah. Um, because you can't sit, you, you got a choice. Are we going to, we got a lead here. We go home. Are we going to sit back and absorb pressure the whole game? That sounds ugly, but are we going to play and open it up? And then they, you know, so there's all this, this, you know, this kind of psychological battle going on that made it so exciting. And you had all these big comebacks, but in the final, I think more than anything is that the English league finishes three weeks before the final and the teams were just so, they just hadn't played you, as a professional athlete. You need rhythm. And yeah. And sharpness. And when you can't get that in practice, when the lights go on, it's really hard just on three weeks of practice to be at your best. And you could Makes see that sense. in both teams. You're Canadian, but you're an honorary American. Thank you. Um, Pulisic, mm. what are your thoughts? This is the, by far the best yeah. American player we've ever had. 
Talent wise, yeah, and the and the level he's gotten to already, yeah, for sure. He's, I mean, he's. It's going to be very interesting because he's he's. I thought he's been pretty sharp so far. Started yeah. at Chelsea. I don't, this is not a level above him. He's he can thrive at this level. He's gifted. He's quick. He's got a quick mind. Um, he's versatile. He can pass. He can he can score. He, he's a great attacking player. It, at these clubs like Chelsea, though, where there's there's money and there, and obviously, luckily for him, they have a two window transfer ban, so they can't really recruit over him. Or these clubs, though, in the future, they're going to have the opportunity to go and buy a great player. And so, it, it, as much as of anything, it's like, will he find his role and his spot in this team and the dynamic and the way they want to play and own it? Because before they make a move, right? Because if if he he can be a great great player, but if he doesn't quite fit and and really nail down his position, his role in in the way that they play, you know, he, he, then what he is can, his he position? Flounder. You know, because they, they he's, definitely move him around all yeah. over the place. He's a creative midfielder, attacking midfielder who kind of you know he plays on the fence of like um of a striker midfielder. So he he. But he do you think he can be a ten ultimately? He or can no? be a ten uh, because a lot of modern tens start wide. Yeah. And come in. So we don't necessarily play with that 10 in the hole any, as much anymore, like that sits behind the striker or as a second striker or as, you know, in between the midfield and striker. So he can drift into those areas and be really dynamic. But when you're a little guy in this big, in this game, there's not those, that's not where the space is. So you see a lot of these guys drifting out wide now, Hazard, Neymar, yeah. you know, even Messi starts way out on the right and he cuts in. And, and Pulisic is a little bit like that where, you know, he finds his space and then he can use his quickness and his connect, he can connect with his teammates really well. Play one twos get in behind the defense either with a dribble or a pass. He's got he does have a final ball in him. He's already gotten some beautiful assists for Chelsea. So he's dynamic and tricky. And if he gets between the lines, or as they say in soccer, in the half spaces that are you know just out towards the edge of the box, you know he's he's really really talented and gifted. And it's amazing to see an American play to this level. I can't believe it. He does seem like he's just a level higher. It would have been mm. like putting mid two thousands U on a team like some college team. <laughs> with some of the Americans that he's playing with, like who I think some of them have potential, yeah. but he just clearly is seeing things mm. that his teammates aren't totally seeing yet. Yeah. Um, and that and that you know every sport, like people say, what's the difference when you go up a level? It's the speed of thought. Yeah. It's speed of thought. Like you, you can say, well, the guys maybe a little quicker, a little stronger, a little better skilled, but none of it matters if they are not thinking quick. And that's what it is. He he thinks the game quicker than than his contemporaries. Can you tell the Knicks fans that RJ Barrett's going to be good? RJ's going to—he is going to be good. He I mean, is. you're biased. Yeah, I'm biased. Hundred percent. But you've also biased. known him his whole life, and you believe in him as a competitor. He's a. I am. I have gone all in on RJ Barrett just mm. because you're so passionate about this, and I mm. trust you. So if yeah. I get burned on this, I'm yeah, you, you all. And rightly, I should be punished if I'm wrong. But you know, he. Uh, you know, he's a he's a he has a great feel for the game. He I know at Duke sometimes force some plays. You know they had no shooting, and they all sat in the paint. and And I think Coach K knew he was our the best playmaker, um, so he put the ball in his hands a lot. And so sometimes he looked bad, and that necess isn't necessarily the fault. It's the fault of being an 18 year old on a college team that didn't have any shooting, and you know, and also he played with Zion, which made it really that, difficult that was the for part people everybody, to ex ex expect. Yeah, because nobody. Why doesn't that Zion in? have the ball? And 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 reality is that Coach K knows that on a clogged defense. You're, it's, you're not doing Zion any favors. You're doing a kid that's played the point half his life. You know, like, let him have the ball. Yeah, maybe Zion could have had it a little bit more here and there, but it was just, these are young guys on a team with not a lot of shooting who basically have similar skill sets that want to get in the paint. So I think at times it, it looked bad, but great experience for him. Um, and he also showed, I think he was like almost like maybe the leading ACC scorer ever. Made every pass in the book for freshmen, you yeah. know, for a freshman. Um, made every pass in the book, great competitor. I also like that he great navigated, kid. he ends up on a he's the number one guy in high school, goes mm -hmm. to Duke, ends up with this guy Zion, and now Zion's a unicorn. Mm -hmm. And everybody's like, Zion, 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 mm -hmm. more Zion. Why does he get Zion ball? Zion's the best. I love Zion. And he's got to navigate this as a freshman in college. I yeah. just, I couldn't navigate anything as no. a freshman in college. It, it, I think that's really hard. And a, he's on national TV. It's a tribute to him and his parents. Um, his mom, his um, dad, I played with for years, outstanding. And he's got a world class mom. And so he's just a kid that he deals and adapts and is like, it's okay. And they became best friends, you know? So uh, he, that was another thing I liked that those guys, instead of, having a little something yeah. like they're actually like legit yeah. best friends yeah you know they and and i think those are like we underestimated i think you gotta like 
that you, if you have strong values and are a good person, you have a better chance. You have a better chance to navigate this crazy world. And and I think we've shown signs of that from him already at a young age. It is incredible. I would throw in the crazy work ethic too. Because yeah. I do think he's one of those guys that would be in the gym. Yeah. That's all he knows. In the summer and just be like, oh, that's all this he knows. summer I'm working on corner threes and I'm shooting a million a day. That's all he knows. And his... I think for him, his, his the challenges are going to be obviously continuing to be a better shooter, but he's trending way up from where he was three years ago. Um, well, New York's a challenge. That's a really big spotlight. It, that, I mean, it's better if he's in Memphis sure, than in New York. That's going to be a challenge, and he'll take some lumps. But he he and I think his his foot speed. Um, he he's he's still he's still a young guy. He's not. Uh, when he gets momentum, great athlete. But out of from the dead start, he's got to he's got to improve there. And so he can overcome that with maturity. He can overcome that because he has a great feel for the game. Uh, he can pass. He can and he obviously can slash and score. So I think he'll have success early. But he's got a lot of maturing to do. He's going to be really really good. I called Jalen pretty early on, and I was like, "This guy reminds me of you in college." There's some differences, but mm. feel for the game, the lefty thing. There's just a rhythm that he has, yeah. and I was like, I don't want to, I don't want you to get mad because Jalen's yeah. very possessive, and you know, <laughs> I was like, is it okay if I say? It? I was like, no, 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 I see it too. Yeah, yeah. And Jalen would have been like, yeah, how dare you? Yeah. But he, uh, he, he see the felt gifts. Yeah. the feel of the game thing is definitely there with him. I thought he <laughs> took too many shots last year, but yeah. I also think their team wasn't right. It was kind of the wrong right. group of dudes, and they went through all that together. Yeah, right. Like it's not like they get a, they got a, you know. That now they can go back and try again this year and sort out where those imbalances were. So it all unfolded in front of our eyes. And so I really respect the way those guys showed class and they never complained. They never made excuses. You know, they, they grew, they had a great year and they took their lumps in the end. Canadian national team next year. Well, we're obviously Are you well, still he, in charge. He, he could be, no, he, he could be you resigned. Uh, uh, I'm here as an advisor, whatever God, you they love need. advising people. God, it's pretty good, huh? You're like advisor Steve Nash. Yeah, it's it's kind of like that gray area of like I didn't resign, but I'm not. I don't <laughs> have to do anything. <laughs> but I, I I I gave five summers, you know, donated those or years of that time, still playing to try to help the program get out of this. Now, uh, RJ's dad runs it, and uh, wow, which is great, guy. you know, yeah, which is great. But we're it's just, I mean, what do you think? Like all these. Canada, I don't know how many, what, would you want to say 10 or more NBA players not going to the World Cup? I don't like it. it like, it, it, and it's a generational thing. I just I, think there's no way there's, I, I went nuts about this on Twitter a couple weeks ago. There's no way it doesn't help a younger player well, to be yeah. with a different coaching staff and to play against other good players yeah. for three weeks right. and then to get thrown into sure. some weird country with sure. real, how are you not better after sure. that? I went to the Olympics in 2000 and it's springboard in my career. I mean, really? Yeah, it was a huge, it was the best experience in my career. And I think that next year, I think I was a borderline all star with Dallas. Yeah. It, it, uh, it's a great playing experience. Like people are so, it's first of all, culturally, the guys, these guys have so many options. It doesn't seem to mean as much anymore in this generation because you have so many options to represent your country. Yeah. The World Cup is not the Olympics. You know, just societally, culturally. But remember when Durant same. broke out in 2010 100%. because of the World Cup. No, you're, you know, for me, I'd love to see these guys play. And then also this whole workout culture, you know, like guys, it's like, you know, I don't know if it's, we've taught guys the way to is have a great routine and work really hard, but that's now manifested itself into this really rigid, I got my workout guy, I go to the gym, I put in, you know, I do my drills and it's, that, that's good. But that's one component. Like you should be playing one on one and three on three and we five should be on a couch right now. We called two old guys on the couch just complaining yeah, just about these young bitching kids. Bitching about everything. And no, I, I'm I, with I, you. And don't get me wrong, I love basketball, the new generation, all these young players. Huge fan. Love it. But I do think that, you know, it's got this workout culture has gotten so far in one way and sort of like it just lacks creativity and imagination now. And well, and the, and the missing piece, which we're we're dancing around, is like it's good to get thrown into an uncomfortable situation mm. when you're a basketball player. Mm. Like it's okay to not have to go to the same gym with your yeah. trainer for three straight months playing against the same nine guys you've been playing against. By the way, like how about getting a chance to play in a game that matters? Yeah, in the summertime. Like shit, my country. If we don't lock down and get a stop here. My country loses. Like that's a little bit better. I'm than so happy. Going... I have four Celtics on yeah. this USA team. Yeah. I'm so happy. This yeah. is great. It is. But 
I, I'm just, I'm dumbfounded by some of this stuff because even if you look at, so I was looking at the 08 team, which had Kobe and Kid on it, yeah. and they're kids at the tail end of his prime. Kobe's at his prime. And you have LeBron and you have Melo and you have Bosch. Um, and there was one more young guy on that team. And all of them went on to have the best years of their mm. career, or at least at, at that sure. point in their careers, just from being around mm. those guys and just learning different pieces of yeah. things. Right. And that's what I think we lose with this stuff. I agree. Um, I don't know how we we I don't know how we can shift the mentality so that these guys recognize the opportunity because I I get it like you you don't want to like you're getting to the end of your summer now you got to go off for six weeks like that's that's a lot for a guy that's been traveling the country for you know eight nine months I don't want to call out anyone but Devin Booker um, <laughs> who's never played in a meaningful game in his career. And he looks at the Team USA thing and he's like, I'm good. I'm going to work on my game. I want to get ready for the season. It's like, you need this more than anyone in the league because you're actually talented mm. and you've never been in a in a big situation ever. Like this would be incredible for you. The three-point line's perfect. We need you. Like get take a win. Look at go, what yeah. happened to Duran in 2010. Okay. I mean, Devin would be amazing in this it's environment. Bit, literally perfect. Be like you'd be like shooting, it'd be yeah. like layups for him. What is it like? Twenty two feet. Would have loved to see him out there. That's all I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> who else do you have in Canada? Well, I mean Canada. So for example, like Olenek, Jamal Murray, Shea Alexander. I forgot about Jamal Murray. Shea Alexander, Gilchrist, uh, G- Gilchrist Alexander. I mixed him up with. Yeah. <laughs> uh, who else? Um, Any of RJ? Trey Lyles, RJ. Um, I'm going to forget some Tristan Thompson. So those guys can play next year unless they, they don't qualify. Year. They can play next year. Andrew Wiggins. Uh, you go, like, there's, I, by the way, there's, so I think Olenek and Corey Joseph are still hopeful to play, but Olenek got hurt. But I, 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 I'm trying to think who was, well, the, you, you got the other rookie. What's the really good, Nikhil Alexander Walker? Oh, yeah. Um, he was good in Summer he's League. He's excellent. He's a very good player, you know, but there's, I think, I'm throwing it out here, but I think there's at least 10 NBA players that aren't playing for Canada this summer. Um, and they're but it, all young But next players. summer they could. We, hopeful. I mean, the, it, it's a gener- it's the golden generation, but if they, you know, we how do we shift to where international basketball means something? Not just like winning and losing, but means something in your development as a player. Because it, it, it's just lost its luster, I think. And, and the players have so many options these days. And they, like it's, Nobody's nobody in their corner is saying this is really good for you. You should produce an infomercial <laughs> where it's like you and and uh, KD and just like twelve guys who are like, my career is in a better spot because I did this this one time at this specific point in my career. Because I, I look at somebody like Tatum, mm. who I think he he a little disappointing last year for what I think his ceiling is, but I still feel like he has the chance to be mm-hmm. really, really good. For sure. I'm so happy he's playing in these games. Yeah. I, all this is going to do is make him better. There's no downside at all. So it's so good for anyway. a totally different look at competitive basketball. Right. For him, right. Like it's, it's great. And, and these guys are still so young. You're in Australia. You're playing right. in a football stadium. <laughs> Patty Mills is running a pick and roll with Andrew Bogut. Right. Crowds going nuts. The sight lines are weird. Like yeah. that's helpful. It's it much is. better than being a gym. Uh, Steve Nash. Good luck with Tottenham this season. Thanks Appreciate for being it. on. Thank All you. Right. All right. This is a rare treat. Koppelman and Levine. I usually get Koppelman. It's hard to get two guys on the phone at the same time. Levine gets overshadowed. He's like the Chris Bosch on the Miami teams. But we're in studio. He's, he's just grabbing rebounds and n- n- not getting enough yeah. press attention. Dishing at key times. Yeah. Um, we're through four seasons. Four seasons? Bosch, mm-hmm. definite Hall of Famer, right? Oh, yeah. I think he is, for sure. I think there's a kind of a closet. He was more important to the two title teams than Wade was argument <laughs> that I've been circling for like we're four big, years. We're big Chris Bosch fans, Levine and I. Absolutely. He Bosch visited set. Yeah, so what is so what is the NBA athlete hierarchy for visiting the set versus actually just outright asking for a cameo? Well, you know, everyone always talks do they, about how do they smart- leave the set first and then go for the cameo, or do they go right to I want a cameo? We do a meeting first. We always do a meeting you first feel with out. the person before a cameo to understand what we're dealing with, get a vibe, and then figure out like how we can set the person up to win. You know, right. all Simmons wants is a cameo, but he only wants the right. Here's the great. Bill Simmons and and why he's so good at what he does and running the all of media. 
is that um, I think you're our generation's Howard Stern, by the way. Oh, yeah. You're yeah, like I mean, the, you are. I think you're, the, you're, I think you're our generation's yeah, Howard. I'm trying. Be, because you just need the compendium book. You need to start releasing those books that are just interviews with people. Yeah. Now, like you just take a bunch of these pods and just make that a book. Oh, that'd be fun. And then, well, yeah. Like that's, and then that'll just, you get a huge advance. Yeah. I have to do no work at all. And I pretend I wrote a book. Yeah. That you write great. an introduction, you get some of your friends, you get Jimmy to write like yeah. the forward, like he did for Howard. Right. And you're done. <laughs> that'd be great. You should totally do that. But the the thing of it is, is Simmons is so good, Dave, because he, he's like, I want a cameo, but I want it to be only if I don't have to go. You're like, only if it's in my podcast and Axe comes here. I'm sorry. I just had a good idea. <laughs> Axe, Axe on my podcast. It's just a winner idea. It makes a lot of sense. Axe is writing a book. Uh-huh. Like I saw the, uh, the Rockets owner. He's Tillman Furtada. Yeah. He wrote some book. It's like, it's called like uh, Success is a Privilege or it's got one of those like aggro rich yes. guy titles. <laughs> So Axe could write a book. And think, it's his books like yeah. Axe, Axe to Grind, <laughs> something like <laughs> no, that. No, it does write itself. Yeah. If you, you should just come and spend a, a month in the writer's room with us. I want to do that. That'd be come, amazing. Yeah, that's, we just need you in the... Do you think... Uh, you, you, you know what you need in your writer's room is a middle-aged white guy. We don't, they, those true. are the we hardest don't things to that. find. It's true. Hardest yeah. things to find. How close days. are you to 50? Uh, three weeks. Three. It's <laughs> happening right now. Yeah. So exciting. I really like. I'm. I'm. I'm battling uh, a lot of stuff with this. You feel on things? Why? I didn't. Well, you hit it right. When'd yeah. you hit it? I'm 53. You hit it too. Oh yeah. 51. I'm 51. Well, because there's these there's these little marks right that you hit in life. Like the f- 21, it's all gravy. 25 even is awesome. You can rent a car without having to have like. But then when the uh, when the first athlete that's like in your age group gets either a little washed up or hurt or goes down, it's really like alarming. And then from down there, it's just a series of anti-victories mm-hmm. from that point on. Dear, so true. Brian had such a massive, massive meltdown at 40. I mean, he's a year and a half older than me and he yeah. had such an epic collapse that he really sort of did it for both of us. As I approached, <laughs> I was like, well, I mean, I can't even sort of, I can't even dabble with having a problem right. with 40 because he made such a mess of it. He set such I, a high bar for yeah, overreaction. So yeah. I mean, it was really ridiculous. I was actually fired up for 40. Oh, no, I, I was in a really good place 50. career-wise. He, came 50 I skated through 50. he skated through 50 like uh, Eric Hyden or something. And and I uh, I wrestled with that one a little. That was not a good time at all. Yeah. It's hard to see the upsides. I'm not feeling good about it because it's it's the last one before like every birthday after that, you're just one step closer. Well, you think to about- To the window in the nursing home, like that can kind of has an ocean view, but not really. I mean, just think about all the pro wrestlers <laughs> dead by our age. Right. I mean, and not because of a plane crash. No, I mean, they steroids just, and violence. They just expired. Yeah. <laughs> there was their, that, their time on this earth was just, it was just over. I got to say, I'm always surprised now when older wrestlers die because I assume all of them are already dead. Like Harley <laughs> Race died a few yeah. weeks ago. I was yes, like, Harley Race was alive? It's like legendary well, smoker and then, drinker well, you guy. Get, you get to have a, a twofer on that because then when uh, Terry Funk is saying how sad he is, you get to be like, wait, Terry Funk's alive too? <laughs> right, right. You get the twofer. The, and Mick Foley, all these dudes. Well, they, Foley's much younger than those guys. Yeah, but he was he was hardcore for... He 20 hurt years. Is your son over it or is he still watching? No, he's still into it. He's he's become, he's hit that stage now where he thinks he's knows more than anybody who's running any of AEW and WWE, NXT. Like he always thinks he has a better answer so than whatever sharp, their plots are. He's a sharp. He really is. He's not a mark. What do you he's think of his answers? He it's maybe impressive. has it. Could no, be in he the really blood. is. Like you realize that by the time you hit 11, you could probably book wrestling. Yeah. He could book NXT probably for three months. And yeah, I think that's a great. He should make him the mini commission of. Uh, <laughs> <That'd be great. laughs> the mini commission of NXT. Cool. But suit. AEW, are you feeling like AEW is where the action is now? Well, so I think they made a mistake. I think doing a weekly TV show is, you know, that's like going fifty-two weeks a year with billions. Like at some point, they're in a nice spot with just like these impact pay-per-views yeah. and kind of floating in and out. When you're on every week, that's a different animal. The you really need a big enough roster. You got to really like string together I mean, long story Omega, lines. Omega and to me, Omega and Jericho are two of the more fascinating men to watch now. Right. Becky, Becky Lynch to me is the most fascinating person in wrestling. Yeah. But, but uh, on, the male, on, the, on the guy side, I do think that they have these two dudes who are the most interesting to watch. 
Jericho and Omega. So that feels like it can go for a while, no? See, I, I think it could, but I, I think wrestling's in a weird spot right now because the yeah. wrestling we grew up with, they're just playing to every stereotype. The characters are over the top and they could basically get away with whatever they want. I mean, the Iron Sheik became... What was he? Him and uh, Sergeant Slaughter, they were Iraqi sympathizers and stuff like that would never fly now. And now it's like they have to have their villains kind of be these, you know, anti-hero type, but they can't really go for it. And I think they're missing a golden opportunity because we're in the trigger generation now. Wrestling should be like taking advantage By of that the way, more Trigger than anybody. is a great character name. Trigger. So much. Dude, Dude, we should triggering the really, fans. Call really, Vince. Yeah. Trigger. A we got a wrestler. No, no, he's no, the, the opposite. He's, he's the opposite. He's the trigger. Oh, he triggers. Yeah, that's yeah. what you'd ask him. Are you saying you're sensitive? <laughs> no, I'm the trigger. You're the trigger. <laughs> yeah, he's going after the twenty somethings. Uh, he should be masked so that because he's too. He knows if people knew who he was. That's true. He's <laughs> a mask. The the trigger has to be a masked wrestler. <laughs> And it's like an anonymous and then we Twitter reveal, account. Yeah. No, then we reveal who it really is. You know what I mean? And it's got to be surprising who it turns out to be. Oh, yeah. So it's like, oh, my God. It's, so, it's well, Kurt Angle coming back. The mask would almost come off during the matches, right? Like somebody would almost pull it off and then he'd get out of it. Yeah. Oh, because if people find out who he is, everyone's right. going to pile be, on him online. Yeah, well, then Honestly, he'd really Vin, trigger him. This is true. If, if Paul and Vince don't do this, they're really <laughs> missing out. Trigger comes out. He does ten minutes on how great this Chappelle, <laughs> Chappelle special yeah. was. He, the Trigger, audience is going nuts. The audience Trigger is comes crying. out. And goes, he comes out and does old Andrew Dice Clay bits. <laughs> <laughs> like he just does them word for word. Hickory dickory dock, and the, everyone's losing their mind. The young their wrestlers are stuff. crying. They're that, having traumatic a great experience. Idea. Trigger. You could, Trigger is could be. I'm trying to think what wrestler would be the perfect. Kurt one Angle to do could do it. With a, is, Kurt Angle with a mask. Kurt Angle with a mask. used to reflect like kind of things that were going on back in the day, right? The other thing is it's too broad. The other problem, look, I think they made a good decision bringing Bischoff and Heyman in to, to now. Well, you're going deep dive pro- now. Well, those guys are the, brought in to Ron program Smackdown. Raw and SmackDown yeah. now. And I mean, I could switch. We could do this about Haruki Murakami, but I'm not sure that everyone wants to hear that. I'm saying we could switch to literature if you want. I'm just but I'm amazed you guys wrestling. have time to follow wrestling. Levine, well, Levine seems like he's out. I yeah. don't really. He's out. I, I he's have doing to. It for everybody. He checked but out two minutes the ago. The grimy, uh, the thing that the WWE is missing, and I think even your son would, if when we watched it as kids, it was barely lit. It was da- you. Be- it was even if you knew the matches were rigged, you believe there was danger. It doesn't. It's not dangerous now. That's yeah. the problem. It's not creepy. It's supposed to be creepy. But we live in an age um, where there's not the same kind of mystery with. There's not, right? The creepy. The, the, there's not really, they're trying to appeal, when you try to appeal to everyone, you kind of like risk losing a core audience, right? You should do a creepy billion season. All right. Pitch he, it out. Pitch well, it out. There's, how many like seasons? a Halloween episode? Is no, that how many seasons? Like, well, Giamatti, <laughs> Chuck could, uh, you know, the S&M thing could go really wrong. Right in the wrong hands. Like he he meets the wrong dominatrix. He starts harvesting people. Do you, you think Dave, you and I love Mindhunter so much? Because it is it is like the creepiest show on TV. Are you a Mindhunter, Mindhunter fan? Hunter. I, I'm not. It really bothers people in my life. You just don't like it or you haven't tried? I gave it one whirl, but it, I, I might need to go on another date. It's just so watch good. season two. Just jump is right it in. Is it still Fincher? Is he still doing it? Yeah, it's like half in. of them this season. Oh. Do you like Zodiac or you don't like Zodiac? I do. So if I like Zodiac, yeah. I'm going to like Mindhunter? Yeah. You know, Chris Ryan's going to be so mad if it if you guys talk me into Mindhunter because he's been like <laughs> hitting me with a two by four about it for. But I wasn't doing it advisor. I'm just like saying Mindhunter's really good. Like so, creepy billion season that a uh, evil dominatrix. That's all I got. I don't know what else could happen. Yeah, okay. I'm, I, we'll I, I think how do you it. sketch this out though? So, like, do you have in your head now how many seasons it is? We have we have variations. You know, we have a way that it could end like after next season, after the following. Um, but, you know, every season we get together, usually uh, Brian and and I come up with like a starting point and we'll probably come up with the end point also. And we start meeting with our writer's room. We start talking about it. Once we find like a sort of pivot point in the middle, then then the details start to fall in. So it's, it's really like, like a two it's year like a plan? starting energy thing and then an end point there of a season. You, you always are rolling through knowing you kind of do every idea you can in the upcoming season. So right now we are like we've we've written the first episode of season five. Dave okay. And I wrote that episode and we've outlined most of this season, the big events of this season. 
And then as you're going, you kind of start to have ideas that, that tell you where it could, you know, where it could go. We're, this is season five. We definitely know how to tell the story through season seven. Um, so you go into like season four last year, season five this year, and in a sentence, you're trying to think, this is what we want to accomplish this season. So last season was the Taylor is now going against Axe. This is our main plot this year. How are we resolving this? Yeah, and we usually, I mean, we have a thematic every season that just we know that expresses sort of the emotional terrain. Yeah. And then you try to, and then, you know, um, I know you know this, but I don't know if people know, we do a tremendous amount of research. So that's part yeah. of how you, part of the way we discover it, and you can do this in a show that's like going on now in a way, is we meet with the people, men and women, in this industry, both sides of the industry, all sides of these industries, and we just kind of get them talking. And they give you tidbits. Yeah, a lot. They're they like, there's us- a recession coming in nine months. You guys should tackle like but rich beyond guys recession, getting They'll ready. explain what, like they'll give us a lot of language. The psyche, and the, the psyche of, the tr- of what they're dealing with and you know what their challenges are. Yeah. That's the stuff that's really valuable. And, and because the show is in that world, because the show has some cultural throw and because the people in that world all watch it, they want to tell us the next thing now. Like so they want to the nudge first, you in the directions that they would want to see in the show. They want yeah. to tell you like, here's what's really, here's how, you know, here's why I think this, these people are doing it wrong or this part of the industry is going to be dead. And, you know, that guy really doesn't have a lot of money and he's uh, really just trying to act like, like they'll give you all sorts of stuff and they'll also say fascinating shit. You know, so many little quotes that are in the mo- in the show come from like something some billionaire will say sitting on our couch. So you're basically doing a podcast with them, but you're not taping it. And you're just trying to get info out of them. Basically, and, and you know, the writers have a chance to ask them questions. So it's a whole group of people asking them questions. And, you know, sometimes the answer is the conscious answer, but sometimes they reveal some unconscious answer. That's really interesting. And we go, like we went on a trip, uh, um, a guy we know took us on a trip this week. I think you saw the picture where we met Coach Belichick, but the reason yeah. we met Coach- I loved it. Sick. <laughs> I felt like you were finally broken. I, I texted you immediately. You were like, oh best. man. I know. A picture of you and Belichick. I imagine how much it hurt. <laughs> Me, it really did. Dave likes him. Dave likes the team, the Pats. I, I admire him. Well, Dave him. appreciates so excellence genius. and yeah. consistency and success. But like all these guys just break you down. They, break, they do break you down. In other words, there are things I would have said about Belichick last week, but proximity, you know, that column you wrote a long time ago, which we've all not Back when lived I wrote? up to. I remember when you were a writer. You were, yeah. you were a great writer, back, by back the way. Back in the day. Before back you were a great career. writer. Yeah. Really, people, people, kids who are listening now don't understand how good a writer oh, you thanks. were, which thanks, isn't God, such man. a compliment because really what it's saying is <laughs> you've I'm, abandoned all of I've your been, true, yeah. the, the true thing that made you special. Well, it's, it's that, other, the thing other that, than that, I'm fine. Well, at your core, the thing that <laughs> you are, the thing Goldman never gave up until his gonna, dying it's day. It's going to come back. I'm just on hiatus. But what you, when you did, and you talked about the danger of the proximity, you said, I'm never going to be the guy. Now, we all became the guy. But you said, I'm never going to be the guy who hangs out with the players. I'm never going to know him. Because you, you, you talked about the, the sort of gift of that kind of objectivity. But the truth is, as we grow and evolve, um, you also couldn't tell the lie. When you became rich and successful, you couldn't tell the lie that you weren't. You are. So you had to, that's the experience you're looking at it from Well, now. I also changed my... Idea of not getting to know people who were in yes. the, I actually was the most interesting thing I did this yeah. decade was probably the Kevin Durant. Get to know a lot of different people. It's the best thing ever. Yeah. It made your thing better. But the proximity, the challenge of proximity, as you know, and it happens to us, we have to keep, be careful about it with the billionaires, and it happens with Bill Belichick, is before meeting him, I would have been like, oh, if I met that guy, I'll definitely be like, hey, cheating Bill. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then you meet him, and of course, he's smart and charming and um, engaging, and you're never going to say cheating Bill to him because he's this great, brilliant genius. Who... Well, there's also a white light above him as you're talking to him. <laughs> well, yeah. a, there is a halo effect you happening You could see it, yeah. right? Absolutely. It's a it's halo palpable. in the form of six rings. You loved him. And it was hilarious because he was like really well-dressed and totally eloquent. It was like everything the NFL wants out of him. And he'll yeah. just give them like a sweatshirt and a grunt right. at a press conference. And then He'll go in private and be like a great gentleman. He's he's weirdly misunderstood though, because- (laughs) He's so smart. No, because every once in a while, there'll be a press conference. He's the worst press conference guy ever, but then somebody will ask him a cool question 
Yes. And he'll answer for like two minutes. Well, that's what it is. It's and really, it's like football school. And it's like, whoa. Yes, it's a you moratorium know, on bad questions. Yeah. And those those that's people what Popovich should, does. If I was going to go into those conferences, my challenge would be like, I got to get this guy talking. I'm not going right. to give him something that shuts me down, you know, in a one word answer because it's the 80th time somebody's asked him. That would have been my strategy with Popovich on the sidelines. I would have gone every time, like, what bottle of wine does your team remind you of tonight? Like, exactly. something like he would have been like, oh, fuck, yeah, I got to answer stop that. Talking. Oh, really? It's like a Barolo from 1998. <laughs> That's like, so good. You hate, yeah. like, of course he's going to answer That's that. That's so good. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, so with, with the way we got to go was some guy we know who's like billionaire adjacent was having an event and he asked us if we would come speak to a group of people. Billionaire adjacent. Well, what's happening you on guys? His way. He's, he's on, on his, his way. way. There oh, were all these billionaires. Way. Yeah. There were all these billionaires. So he flew us up there with them. We did the whole, you know, thing. And then we got to watch all these guys around and women, one incredibly successful woman. Um, we got to watch them all around Belichick and you get to see the dynamics. And, you, you know, if you're a writer, as you know, you, you, you're in it, but you're also observing it. And then you just that stuff just all surfaces back when you're writing. Like suddenly you'll remember three words that somebody said or the way that they wanted to make sure Belichick knew they were special or the, the way someone tried to act like they, they didn't want to tell you how many airplanes they had and then they let it out. This, this, I was talking to this one guy. Because they and, wanted to. Well, I was talking to this one guy who owns a private company and they said that they had four private jets, the company. And I, so I said, wow, that's amazing. The, the company or you? And he goes... Well, I mean, what difference does it make, really? You know, it's all the same. And you're just like, oh, awesome. Just awesome. Yes. Um, and you, the closer you can get, the more you can unearth them. I, like, I think really what we're doing with, with Billions in showing these, these billionaires is, is it is like the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. It's like they've not really been shown in the way that they are. Yeah. And because we got to get close to them, we're able to put them out there. Who remembers the tidbits better, you or Levine? I like, is one of you, like, writing them down on like, cocktail like, napkins, or you yeah, rehash he'll get, him, he'll get him talking, and I'll be writing them down. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We have a Like, system. secretly, or are you pretending you're texting? Just sort of, like, in a low-key way. <laughs> one of these guys called us, a guy who gave us huge stuff, a guy we love, actually, not a bad guy, good guy, but he gave us over a series of five dinners over, every season we have dinner with this guy, and he gives us reams of material, but, and this year we used something <laughs> that was <laughs> very close, to the, close to the bone, and he calls up. And he just goes, I figured the whole thing out. He goes, I'm sitting there having a conversation with you and I'm laughing. And he goes, Levine is just sitting there quiet as can be. And he's just writing down every goddamn word I say <laughs> so you can use it against me. And I was like, yeah, but you know, you're telling us. And he goes, oh yeah, yeah, God. but I, I forget. Yeah, I think like, I'm oh, just- you got me good on that one. Yeah, then we had dinner with him yeah. the other night and he, but he still told us a lot of stuff. Yeah. What, for these billionaires, what like three things are you the most jealous of other than like the crazy amount of money? Like when just being in that world, what do you look around and go, oh man, all right, that would well, be cool. I mean, cool. the plane is the obvious thing, right? Yeah. I mean, what a great luxury those guys have with the planes. Um, they they just have this sort of like ease of mind, right? Like they don't have to worry about anything for maybe generations, you know? Like if they want to pass it on, they could take care of like endless amounts of family. Yeah. That's something. What, what's another one for the you? The material things don't. Uh, it's not, yeah, it's what David said. It's the fact that they're, but it's weird. The thing that's the mo that they have that most people can't have is access, right? They have every person, you got to really understand it. I know you do, Bill, but like you got to really think about it. There's nobody who's further than one phone call away from them. And so to me, the idea that they want to talk to the prime minister of a country that prime minister will have dinner with them tomorrow night anywhere in the world because there are all these people who they owe favors to or they could do favors to, they get to them. Also, many of these people, especially the ones who didn't inherit it, they have a remarkable set of skills. I mean, with some of them, it's literally like I mentioned Mark Andreessen to you. Dave and I think he's maybe the smartest person we know. He's a billionaire. Um, he and I have done each other's pods. We've known each other for a very long time now, for a long time, not a very long time, but a long time. And... Um, I mean, it's just, honestly, sitting with them, you realize they're able to access um, a snapshot of the world in their minds, and they're able to synthesize information in a way that I never could. And that, you know, that thing of being around people who are 
order of magnitude smarter than you are. For me, to, you know, like in the Highlander, the quickening, if yeah. I could just have, I mean, that's the thing. Mark Andreessen was building the engine and I was watching the Highlander 10 times. But like, <laughs> you know, so unfortunately, <laughs> like, but that idea that, that they're able to see the matrix in a way that it doesn't matter how smart we are as sort of like guys in the world, it's an order of magnitude different. And that to me, it's not, it's that, it's the ability to apprehend the world the way that some of them do. Cause the material stuff, the access, which I think is the most rarefied thing, we all have a version of I, that. My thing would be the secret handshake club that exists where they all kind of know each other, which I, I think it's like this, but, it's like the Soho house for human beings. But don't and you think you're in They're the, just passing like, you want to use my plane on yes. Monday? I have court sides. Well, I'll, I'll, when I'm in Golden State, you give me your court sides. I'll give you mine at MSG. And yes, it's there is it's a, like Craigslist for kajillionaires. Yeah, you're correct. Don't you feel access in a way is the best part of your life? Like the fact that you can- But that that's a whole other level. Yes, but you can glimpse at it. Yeah, yeah. And that, don't you find that's one of the things you didn't know ahead of time was going to be available, but is actually maybe the coolest thing that if- that, that you can meet the people who fascinate you and learn from them and be around them. Yeah, I agree. That, um, the Epstein the thing's thing. the biggest thing to happen in rich guy circles this year. Which Does they, that trickle on the Dave, show? Do you want to give your answer to this? Staying away. I mean, everybody says to us, like, you know, you, you got to do a story on Epstein. And we're like, why would we do that? That's just nothing that we want to spend time with. I mean, you, you have a fun and with that. no, you have a fun, entertaining show. Yeah, I don't Who's want to be Epstein the pedophile? subplot. <laughs> yeah. No, that would be terrible. We're staying away. We're not going to. We know what works about the show. We know what people like. No, you don't know what works because you you had the sports team plot and you fucking threw it away. <laughs> what a huge mistake that was. You had it. It was right there. Axe NFL. Ah, 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 it was ah. sitting there, and that you like punted him, it in three episodes. It wasn't for him. He wasn't allowed to have that. You. The two things you love yes, are hot writing scripts and, and the NBA. Love the I would NBA. say those are your top two. I love those things. How yeah. Axe, I, I don't understand what needs to happen for <laughs> Axe to, to, be, to be your Dolan proxy and you can get all your Knicks frustrations out. It's just sitting there. Season eight. I season guess that's nine? the season that you come in the writer's room. Yep. Season eight. When you're ready to come to the writer's room, the we'll NBA is expanding. And where are they going to go? Where do they, They're going they go? Seattle and Vegas. Yeah. And and they offer Axe a chance to own the Vegas team for like 2.5. Did Daniel Negrano end up buying the hockey team? Is he have a piece of the hockey team? For a while, he, might. he was part of getting the hockey team there. No, this is Axe just cutting What's the check for 2.5. I don't know the name of the hockey team. The Vegas, team? The Vegas Knights. The Vegas, Las Vegas Golden Knights. Are they good? Because you know the problem with the they NBA right now. Stanley Cup Finals, their first year. They were one game away. This was told to me by a rich person. The problem with selling these teams now is that the prices are so high. Mm-hmm. Very few people have the money to just write the check. So, yeah. like the guy who just bought the Nets, the Alibaba guy, that guy's fucking rich. Yeah, but that's also one of the biggest companies in the world. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of those guys floating around. So, if you're the Celtics and you're like, not that the Celtics are selling, but if if Wick was like, all right, I'm gonna sell. Yeah, I want two four. There's like seven people on the earth who would like basketball and have that money. So, we are really interested in this idea of not just insanely wealthy billionaires, but what that next level up is. That is something that we will be talking about this season on the show. Oh, You're exactly so I'm stumbling right. into something. Yeah, we're very interested in that idea. Because I noticed that with uh, Portland's for sale and Ellison is the leading candidate. Right, he can do it. He can write a check. He's and they're the like, guys. yeah, he's worth 50 bill. So Blazers are like for two. Like, what is that? Well, yeah, That's Joe, like Joe, he's going to like get sushi tonight. That's he would spend $2 billion. Well, Joe Sai is worth over $10 billion, So that's why he could go take the second half of the Nets. Right. And that's, that's how exactly he, right. that's also how he got Durant. Kyrie, I mean, the amazing thing is how it's improved. So Mark Lazary is a guy who yeah. has been very good to us over the course of the show. And he lets us talk about it. He's co always comes to the writer's room. He spends a lot of time with us telling us the way the world works. But like, if you think about it, Lazary bought that team for like half a bill. He and said now it's he worth got like, them to pay for stuff. Now it's worth like a billion his, six. His own words billion. said, I overpaid for it because in an auction situation, the guy who wins it always overpays. Yeah. You're paying more than anybody else. He said, but it turned out to be a great move. 
Well, and they got the, his the net state threw in for the for the arena a little yeah. bit too. It's just been a wonderful move for for you. Got to have you had him on the podcast? Well, he uh, let's be honest. He they fucking stumbled into Giannis. I mean, that was like <laughs> I give Mark tripled, a lot of credit, but he's triple. Giannis triples the value of that franchise. I give Mark a lot of Plus, credit. Giannis <laughs> is never like going to leave. I actually think he's like the Wait, rare. Have you had Lazary on the podcast? No, I've not. You got to. Should that. I do that? He's great. He's great and owns that team. And he's a bill, self-made billionaire. So entertaining. Grew up in a tiny little apart. He's a fascinating guy. You'd love talking to him. All right, As well, Mallory would say about Bobby in. Axelrod, he came from nothing. Okay. You have to <laughs> Is put Mallory the word here? in for can me. We meet? We've never met you him. You can meet person. Mallory. Yeah, we're wrapping up because Kyle has to go to the Dodger game. Um, when do you guys do you back in LA? Well, I'm going to come to do The Godfather 2 with you at some point. Oh, I'll you're just sure. announcing that? That's going to be a big it on deal. Twitter. No, I know, but we didn't <laughs> announce it publicly. Twitter's not public. Listen, the rewatchables peaked this week. Oh, it was incredible. Sorkin, I listened. Sorkin talking about Butch. I don't, I I don't know. I don't know how he beat You don't think that. we're going to defeat that with the two? So me, you, Fantasy, and Chris doing Godfather 2. What's the over under? Levine, you're an impartial. How many hours is that? Two and a half? I think it's an easy two and a half. I mean, what are you looking to hit? Are you, how many episodes? Well, we, we have one rule with the rewatchables, never be longer than the actual movie was, which we've broken that, like two or three danger. times. That's really in it's danger. It's in danger. With yeah. the, uh, I mean, just the two of us alone talking about two. I have an hour just on Pacino um, finding out that Kay had an abortion. <laughs> yeah, I have, I, have tw- I, I know that I have 20 minutes on the outdoor cafe in Havana oh my with God. Fredo and Michael. Like that is the key scene in the whole movie and people overlook what's going on in that scene because most people don't even understand why Wait. Fredo brought the money. Ooh, you, you're letting it out of the box early. Now, I'm not going to say why. No, most see, people don't know. Save it for the pod. I'll save it. So you're coming back. I have to come for that. I committed at the beginning of the year. Um, I'm going to do it. But uh, By I, the way, I was, I was gonna, I, yeah. I, I, we have to go, but All right, look stop. at Fidgety Kyle is. But- <laughs> um, I was in a, I had a soccer tournament this week with my daughter yes. killing the whole day on Sunday because she only had one game and she wasn't feeling well. So she's sleeping. I banged out. I was doing football research. Rounders was on one of the Showtime channels. I watched it again. Awesome. I don't understand. I, like, why am I not, how do I not get tired of certain movies? I don't, what, what revelation am I going to have for Rounders at this point in my life? I've watched it probably as many times as you guys did. <laughs> It's so I don't awesome, understand though. it. It's the beginning of our friend. I mean, it did start our friendship. I know. Maybe that's part of it. It, it did. No, it's like, oh, you were in watching it over and over then. But there's somehow for guys our age, more, it, it mean, that movie means something about friendship. And then the fact that the three of us did become friends from that um, is one of the amazing little side notes. I have to ask you a question and then we'll go. Uh, JJ Reddick was on my podcast. And, yeah. Or, and, or someone, it was JJ, I think, talking about not asking me why I like watching Houston play basketball. And I really liked watching them. Do you not like watching that team? I dislike it. Right, why? I like uh, I like team basketball. I don't like one-on-one. Never liked the one-on-one stuff. The MJ was the only guy I really like kind of succumbed to with the one-on-one stuff. Do you think Harden is arguably the best player, second best player in the league, or you don't? I think he's in the top, top three or four. Okay. But I don't know if his style translates to four straight playoff rounds that you have to win because there's been – clear signs that each each season in the playoffs as it goes along yes his production goes down oh, oh this is the very last thing and then i know you have to look go. at kyle, kyle just moved kyle, this again the last thing look now it's oh that's my phone <laughs> the yeah. last thing is uh um, uh someone just sent you a link to gary goldman's comedy special the great yeah. depression yeah it's the best comedy special the last 10 years I just have to say that i want to put that out there now before the special airs you got to watch it it's going to destroy you Okay. It is the most He's a moving. New England guy. Yeah. Goal, it's yeah. all about how he saved his life through this comedy stuff, and it's not saccharine. It is brutally honest, hilarious. I saw the taping, and it's one of the great nights of comedy I ever had. And he just texted me today, not knowing I was seeing you, and he's like, HBO sent my special to Simmons. And I said, oh, that's too weird. I'll watch it this weekend. Yeah, you got to um, watch it. It's great. Congrats. Is it going to trigger anybody? Congrats on the new deal. Was it an a new deal with Showtime. Yes, thank you. Congrats. Thank you. Always happy for you guys. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. All right, we're going to bring in Chris Ryan in one second. First, Pepsi takes all NFL celebrations to the next level, whether it's a Hail Mary touchdown, a defensive stop on the goal line, or a Super Bowl win. Super Bowl win. Love those. Let's go, Kyle. Love those. When it's time to celebrate, it's time to crack open a Pepsi. 
I was thinking about my uh, my favorite touchdown celebration moments. Um, Billy White Shoes Johnson. When I was a little kid, they used to cut in. They would do, or they would do the halftime. They would run around, show all the different touchdowns from all the different games in like three minutes. And if he scored, he would do this thing where he like swayed his legs back and forth. It was like this dance. You can, go, you can uh, YouTube it. I'd never seen anything like it. He immediately became my hero. But that was the first touchdown celebration. I really, uh, I really remember, and it led to all the other stuff in the '80s. He never gets credit for it. He was like the Jackie Robinson of uh, TD celebrations. Um, it all led to the Super Bowl shuffle, all that stuff. Billy White Shoes Johnson, you were my guy. Uh, but hey, Pepsi, the official sponsor of the NFL, reminds you to always be celebrating. You can celebrate like Billy White Shoes Johnson. Go check that out on YouTube. All right, let's bring uh, Chris Ryan in. Chris Ryan is here. You've heard of him. <laughs> uh, I had to get it all. <laughs> <laughs> He's getting it out of the way. <laughs> Team USA, though, you're not as into it as I am. Well, I just want to start off the Team USA talk by saying, you know, I've all, we've all heard the news about Tatum possibly retiring. And I just want to tell you, Bill, he doesn't owe you anything. No, he doesn't. He's only 19. And, you know, he's <laughs> no, got he's 21 his now. whole life ahead of him. He <laughs> may want to make some different choices. That would be amazing if he rolled his ankle and then said, I'm good, I'm retiring. And then people are like, congrats to him, man. This is great. <laughs> Can't do it just for him. I want to talk about Team USA. They they had a game in Turkey, which we were taping this on a Tuesday. I got up super early today. I watched the whole game. I love international basketball. I might be in the minority, but I love having the 12 NBA guys, trying to figure out who the hierarchy yeah. of the guys are, how the coach is going to make everybody happy. And then also just how different it is in basketball. It's so much more physical. There's a, it's always in a weird stadium. There's a horn blaring. There's fans cheering. Yeah. And I think you can find out a lot about some of these guys. And there's a moment in this Turkey game where first it was like Turkey's not going away. And then near the end, it was like, holy shit, Turkey might win. What are we going to do? And it was really interesting watching these different guys try to grab the baton. It's especially interesting for this team because it's a team of B options. Yeah. Right? And it's like, who's going to become the A option of these Bs? Is it Middleton? Is it Tatum? Is it Kemba? Guys who maybe they were the stars on their team or maybe their team isn't that big or hasn't played in that many crucial games. So it's fascinating to see, like, how are you going to decide who's the guy down the stretch? I remember you've been talking about this for like 15 years with these team USAs. I love it. Well, but and really, they, you're trying to decide between Kobe and LeBron and Durant. And now you're talking about Middleton and Miles Turner. Well, it turned out to be Kemba in overtime, and that was the biggest reason they won. But, um, you know, it's kind of a flawed team, not by not by anyone's fault because so many guys backed out. But you have Kemba and Mitchell, who are the two most talented guys on the team, and they have to play together, but they're an odd fit. Yeah. You know, and neither of them are really somebody who can stop just the generic – all these international point guards that just come off in an assembly line who kind of know how they're all kind of a little Goran Dragic, a little Jose Calderon ish. <laughs> yeah. And they can all run a pick and it's just hard to stay in front of those guys. Um, they kind of figured out a weird way to play together where Mitchell was so he's crashing the boards. He's basically looks like he really does look like Oh five Dwayne Wade. Like he, he looks like he's gone to another level athletically, but it's a weird backcourt Tatum is almost their kind of de facto small ball center slash four, but they need him on the court yeah. because he does a lot of stuff. Miles Turner was having moments. And then they they were trying to figure out that other spot. And in crunch time to the, in the Turkey game, it was Joe Harris. And he was just out there until he fouled out. So they were basically going Mitchell Kemba, Joe Harris, and then Tatum and Turner or Barnes and or Middleton and that's Tatum. Like, that's like the worst version of the Avengers. Right. <laughs> like, these, are, these are Earth's heroes, really? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, those guys are really into it, though. Yeah. No, I think it's great. I actually like I prefer it this way. I, Me I too. Wish, I wish it was like Olympics. It was like under 23s plus one, which is how the soccer teams usually do it. Yeah. Um, I love it when the young guys are playing. I know that we, it, the thing is, is that we have to decide what our appetite is for possibly not winning. Yeah. I pop made some mistakes, not to criticize a guy with, I think, what does he have? Five titles. Yeah. Um, but I think we're at the stage now. Maybe they learned this in this Turkey game, like pick your nine guys. This isn't AYSO. This isn't like Timmy gets to play and Bobby and Charlie. And it almost feels like they should have done that 
in the way in the, earlier. Yeah, like he should have just been special like special games. Everybody get your excuses out of why you can't play and let me get my night let me get my team so I can figure out who's who. Right. Rather than at the last second, like Deer and Fox leaves and at the last second and this person's leaving. So there's not a lot of flow because guys are getting shuttled in and out. It's way more physical than the NBA, which I actually kind of like. But it's it's one of those things where um if if uh if you get fouled, you really got fouled. But mm-hmm. then they also have these weird rules in there. Like you can have unsportsmanlike fouls. They call it a flopping foul in yeah. the turkey game <laughs> and shit like that. So the vibe is different. It's a little more frantic. It's way more physical. And I think it's interesting to put some of these guys in this little fishbowl and watch them swim around. Tatum's been in big playoff games before, but, uh, and Mitchell has, I, I guess like the Oklahoma city series, but, Mitchell in the regulation. But it's the, coming off like a down year. Like right. it, he's almost like got the gold medal in narrative already because Mitchell somehow has emerged out of this summer when everybody, you've now said the Wade thing a bunch of times. I think yeah. Wendy was like, he looks like everybody's him. talking about Mitchell at the yeah. camp. They, everybody thinks Mike Conley is like going to single-handedly like bring him back into all-star status. Well, he hasn't gotten to the all-star game yet. So we'll introduce him to like the all-star class. So it's kind of interesting to see, like we've kind of crowned him Let's see it now, right? Well, so then Turkey, they need him. And two straight plays, he's kind of in that Dwayne Wade spot. Yeah. And he couldn't deliver. And uh, and I thought Tatum, who hasn't shot well at all, he actually made just so a like couple him, really Mitchell, good Mitchell, basketball plays. Mitchell, Tatum, and Middleton were like eight for 32 in regular. None of them are shooting well. Yeah. It's, it's weird. The stadium's weird. The whole vibe. It, it's a good experience, I think. But... um. But Tatum, like his two-way play and Mitchell's two-way play, Mitchell crashed on the boards Mm -hmm. for these offensive rebounds. He basically got the offensive rebound that saved the game um, that led to Tatum getting fouled. I just like it. I like seeing these guys. And I did a tweet during the game about, I'm still mad Devin Booker's not on the team. I'm just mad as a basketball fan. I think it's good for him. I think it would have been great for the team. And I think he's somebody that in the game today... I think it would have been him and Donovan Mitchell in crunch time. And I actually like the fit together, but Devin Booker, I, I don't feel like anybody could have stopped him in these games, um, but he didn't play. So what was the story behind that? So the story was that he, he was a little banged up at the end of last year. And he told Jerry Colangelo, like, don't even invite me. I'm not going to play. I want to get healthy. Okay. Which I get, but their season, they won 17 games last year. He's been in the league four years. He hasn't had a relevant NBA moment yet. He was in Kentucky for one year. They, I think he made the final four and they lost to Marquette. Mm-hmm. And that's been his entire kind of nut crunching basketball experience, right? Yeah. And, he's like a basketball reference all-star. Yeah. Yeah. So you come out of the game, the NBA, they ran some uh clip after the after the Turkey game. And it was like Miles Turner and he's just walking out like, whoa, that was one of the most amazing games I've ever played in. Like the atmosphere is incredible. And they go to Joe Harris and he was like, Oh my God, that was like nut nut cutting time. Like you just can't tell me you're not better off playing in games like that. So with the Booker thing, I just think, man, why wouldn't Nash and I talked about this earlier, but my, my attitude was why wouldn't he want it? So I did a snarky tweet about it. And then Tatum got hurt like 20 minutes later. That leads to the whole predictable sports blogs. Like, we're like, oh, the tweet backlash. <laughs> the, the, the <laughs> backlashed on Simmons. Like, yeah. the sports blogs, come on, do better sports blogs. <laughs> Meanwhile, like, Tatum could get hurt anywhere. He could get hurt in a pickup game. He could get hurt. You know, Boogie Cousins got hurt. Like, where was he? He was just like in Vegas. If you're playing basketball, you get hurt. That doesn't mean you shouldn't play for Team USA. Um, but then it was like, oh, well, see, this is why Booker is, we shouldn't have played Team USA. It's like, no, that's actually not why. It would have been really good for him to play. Where do you stand on this whole thing? Oh, I think that like it should be, it's, it's like a huge, not even like an honor to, to play for your country as much as it, it's like, why wouldn't you want to play on the world stage like that? You know, like, is it is it really that demanding? And it's like, we also like, there's plenty of times over the course of an NBA season that we can buy you back some rest. You know what I mean? So I, last time I checked, Phoenix is going to go like, what, 25 and 57 again? Yeah. And also, I think you can see this across sports, too. Like when you see a group of guys who have been through some kind of crucible like that, like you often see it in the Champions League 
where it's like players who are young players just like wind up finding out what it's like to try and go in and beat Barcelona or beat Manchester City or whatever. Soccer is a great analogy. And you have to this. go in there and it's like with and and they wind up their careers change. Like there's a guy like so I I we were I was just talking about this on the Ringers Soccer Pod on FC. And we were talking about like are there any players on Liverpool that like still get kind of beat up by the fans, even though they just won the Champions League. And I was like, not really. Like, even the guys who make mistakes are kind of seen as cult figures now. But, like, there's guys like the captain of the team, Jordan Henderson, who a lot of Liverpool fans had a lot of problems with. They're like, never again. He he won on the biggest possible stage. So no matter how bad he, well he plays against, like, Burnley on a Saturday, he's my guy. And I think that that would happen for a lot of these guys on the, on the, on the Team USA, too. It's like, hey, man, I saw that guy win. I saw that guy win on, on an international stage in, in, in a FIBA game. Like, so I'm not going to really crush him when like he's, I don't know, going like a, in second gear on a Wednesday night in November. Right. I, I do think the resume should factor into it a little bit, right? Like even Donovan Mitchell, he's been in the playoffs the last couple of years. They have a chance to win the title this year or at least make the finals potentially in the West. Some pe- a lot of people are picking them as a sleeper. And if he had said, I might have to play a hundred games this season. I can't also add the Team USA stuff to that. You know, I really want to win the title and and I put some thought into this and this is the best decision for me. I could see it. Yeah. I might disagree with him, but I can see that case. But he hasn't for, made an all-star game yet. Like he should want to play yeah, for Team yeah. USA. I would rather he yeah. play Team USA. But if he said that, I'd be like, all right. I think when you're on a lottery team and you've been on a lottery team for four years and you're going to be a lottery team against next year, at some point, don't you want to be in some awesome competitive games that have real stakes? Or do you just, do people not think that way anymore? Because I'm genuinely asking. I think it's disappointing. I think it's a sincere issue if you're like, I'm worried about, like Booker has had a lot of injuries. And if he's saying like, look, like I'm worried about my hamstring going like pretty early on in the season or something, if right. if I go do this, I think that's a legitimate concern. And I think like wear and tear is a legitimate concern. But if you're Devin Booker, like I think the general perception of you is that like basketball nerds kind of like watching you play and think that you have like great stats. But like for the most part, nobody knows who Devin Booker is. You know what I mean? Like I don't think Devin Booker is a household name. And I think that Phoenix is kind of a joke. This is a chance to actually play like, you're right, maybe the most meaningful basketball he's played since Kentucky. You're going to find out something about yourself as a player. Like, I guarantee those dudes in that turkey game. But I wonder if that scares them off. I wonder if Booker's like, if Pop benches me because I'm not playing defense, which is something like no Suns coach ever seems to do. Yeah. I wonder if that's like worse than not going at all. Well, I mean, I don't know. If if Joe Harris is getting played over me, Maybe that's a worse look for me. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Than being like, I'm worried about my hamstring. Well, I didn't just... they say that with De'Aaron Fox yeah. when he played six minutes that last game and then left the next day because it was he like had well, some he, does he not want to But De'Aaron Fox seems like the type of dude who's like, I, I'll do anything to play on this. But team. it seemed like he was losing a spot to Derek White. Yeah, which is like, is that part of is that like deep state Spurs right there? Well, the Derek White thing is kind of inexplicable. Yeah, I gotta say, like when, especially in this game, you're in China. Everything's fucked up about this game. It's this wide arena. Just this, uh, I, I don't want Derek White out there. I'm just, <laughs> I just can tell you. Uh, I was watching simultaneously Brazil Greece was on. Brazil had Barbosa and Verja. I honestly didn't know Verja or Barbosa were playing basketball. I didn't know those guys could still run. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't. I just thought they were retired. Like, I, <laughs> I, at that point, I thought like Hidu Turkoglu was going to be in the Turkey game because it was like, <laughs> oh, I might as well dust him off too. And they're running screen and rolls at the end of the game. And Barbosa understands international basketball, even at the age of 52, however old he is, better than any guard we have other than maybe Kemba. But like, he just, Understands how to navigate it. I don't know. The Brazil think, coach is getting really, really chirping about Giannis. He really was. Yeah. That was weird. They, they ran one shot for him in the fourth quarter. It was weird as it was going on that they just didn't give him the ball 30 feet from the basket and let him do Giannis stuff. But I'm just happy to have basketball back. I really, I, I really thought I missed it. But I think we're at an interesting time just in general with NBA players where am I not allowed to? Is that criticizing Devin Booker to say I thought he should have played Team USA? Are we not allowed to even like make snarky I think, jokes I think you're about just, this? All you're saying is that if you're Devin Booker, 
and you, for the foreseeable future, are going to be on a non-playoff team. I, it's going to be foreseeable for a few years. Why not take every opportunity you can to play a really meaningful basketball game? Why, why not do that? Maybe you just shouldn't do stuff on, you shouldn't tweet stuff anymore like that. Maybe it I should think, just be stuff in so podcasts. So were people coming at you being like, no, they That's weren't coming at me. It was, yeah, well, I just, I, somebody mailed me, I think one of those sports blogs, they had a whole piece and that was the headline. Okay. And I was, I was like, wow. Okay. So, so this backfired. I can't wait till like in the, the Tatum injury. I caused it. Like what, <laughs> what's the, what's, what's the rationale of the blog post? <laughs> if I hadn't done the Devin Booker tweet, Tatum would have two ankles. I think they probably could have planned this a little bit better. It did seem like it was slight. I, I have no doubt that they managed it fine and that the perception of it was a little bit off, but I think they could have planned it better by being like, here's the thing. Next year is when all those, the, the all NBA guys are going to play. They're going to play in the Olympics. So this for FIBA, what we're going to do is, we need one or two all NBA guys to be like, yes, I will play. And then we'll do all under 23s. And that would have been like, it. you wouldn't have had the circus around the summer of everybody's dropping out. Everybody's making these public yeah. announcements. And that way it would have just been smooth. And it's like, hey, look, our under 23s, maybe we just go silver here. But now we've almost, now we're playing against like legends now. Like now we're playing against like this uninterrupted, gold medal rush yeah, the ghost of the uh so it's kind of hard for like if you go out there with joe harris and donovan mitchell and they're like man turkey's kicking our ass it it might be it's a, it's a little bit tough if i was a young player and i could play on a team with other really good guys go through all the practice stuff and then also get coached by all of these guys Pop that have Kerr, won titles yeah. i yeah. just feel like is this going to make me three percent better probably but i i don't know i don't i i have trouble trying to figure out the motivations of of uh, the 20 something NBA players these days, because they really do seem like they love the regimented schedule of, well, I'm going to be here. I'll right. be here for these two months. Right. Every day I'm going to go through my routine and they don't want to go to China, you know? So I don't know. I, I don't know what to make of it, but I think we're at an interesting time with this whole international basketball thing. Cause I think it's going to get worse, not better with you, guys. You, think, you don't think, you think we're going to have problems like this going into the yeah. Olympics next year? I do. So I think no LeBron, I think, obviously no KD probably next year. You talked about the lack of upside for these guys. The downside is just more prominent than the upside. Like losing minutes to somebody you think you're better sure. than. Um, you're you're playing 10 minutes and Joe Harris is playing 28. And right. it's like, I'm better than Joe Harris. Fuck this. Yeah, it did seem like those older team USAs, like there was that never happened because like the five guys who were playing were the five best players like of the century. So yeah. it was just sort of hard to be like mad about like LeBron Wade and you know, like it, it was just sort of obvious who was going to play. They did have that problem a little bit. I think in 96 and 2000 where it was definitely like old generation, new generation. But if you go back and watch some of the 96 games, there's some old guys in that team. Where was Larry Brown? That was later. That was 04. And then Larry Brown's out there trying to get jobs with other countries. <laughs> right. At the same time, <laughs> I would go 23 and under and really, I think that. I think that we are a I would like to think that we are an advanced enough sports society that we would be like, I get it. These guys are U23s. Like it may not always happen for us, but it's going to be really fun to watch. Or even U24s. I like seeing Miles Turner out there. I thought he was actually like weirdly valuable in the Turkey game. We have no bigs anymore. At least he can protect the rim and so run do you around think, and do stuff. Do you think next year, like AD, does AD play next year? Next summer? I don't, I don't think a lot of these guys are going to play. In the and, Olympics? And here's the thing. I do. I think a lot of them are going to figure out ways not to play. And because we're not allowed to criticize professional athletes anymore, I think people are like, hey, man, it's it's their right, man. It's they, you know, those guys, they have a tough <laughs> life They're playing 100 games. They should do what they want to do during the summer. OK, well, we're going to lose the gold medal. Do we care? May I, maybe we shouldn't care. Maybe we should make Logan. I'll Roy care about coach. the other gold medals. Yeah, we, we should. We should win. Yeah. Let's talk about CBS Sports HQ really quickly. Sports television is uh, changing, not always for the better. Yelling, beating topics in the ground, hot takes. Not even sure the hosts believe. Well, CBS Sports HQ is looking to change that with coverage always focused on the game. All the highlights, news, stats, game previews, game reactions, fantasy advice, gambling picks for degenerate gamblers like me. This is made for us. All without the yelling and fake debate. Sports for real. Sports fans live 24-7. Turn it on, leave it on. Completely free, completely free. 
It's free. You don't even need to log in. You don't need a special TV package. Just open the CBS Sports app, watch anytime from anywhere on your phone or at home on your Apple TV, Roku, or Fire TV. Could not be easier. Download the CBS Sports app and watch CBS Sports HQ today. So wait, I want to ask you though, because the, the, especially coming out of the Donovan Mitchell thing where it's like yeah. the buzz is really good about him. It's like a movie that's a, that's a tell your ride and say, like, hey, marriage story. <laughs> Donovan Mitchell is marriage story. But uh, who do you think is, who else is up there in the perception Olympics this summer for the NBA? All right, so the qualifications are... No one's actually seen anything. Buzz? Yeah. A- alleged... Uh, tales of somebody extending their three point range or being in awesome shape. Yeah, it's like it's not even muscle watch. It's just like the vi- like the the whole thing around Utah. I think is like getting a little out of control. You know, what somebody I mean? getting an inch taller somehow. Yeah, yeah. The, the Anthony Davis growth spurt. <laughs> so I think Ben Simmons perception Olympics. I think has uh, yeah. been big. The, <laughs> the new Ricky Davis. Yeah, the the uh, no the real I mean, Ricky Pierce. I yeah, mean, <laughs> making threes yeah. and the fact that he's even taken them in those games. I thought that was good. Uh, Steph Curry playing the pickup game. Oh my god! In Oakland, was that where it was in Oakland, right? Yeah, but it's just like Steph Curry is like the Bay legend is cemented right. now. I think this is a really going to be a really fun year for him with Durant gone and the pressure removed of will they defend the title because they're not going to and Clay gone too. But then I like that Draymond's like if you think that we're not making the playoffs, yeah, you have a fucking head injury, right? Nobody believes in us, but the guys in this locker room. We won fun. three titles, and then Steph having the career year. I like everything he's done this summer. I even kind of enjoy the terrible golf show. Oh you yeah, seen that? the mini golf one. Yeah, yeah no, yeah. I watched him at the Ben Tahoe Simmons Pro-Am, likes that show. Though. Yeah, I think Ben Simmons is the audience. <laughs> it's miniature golf combined with people just being violently assaulted. <laughs> So it's like, like a, a Japanese running, game show. Basically. Yeah, they're running up the course and just getting annihilated and knocked into water. Um, who else? Mitchell Curry, Ben Simmons. What's the Boston vibe? Well, the Boston vibe is just the chemistry vibe, right? It's and like, they, and they do they're get all to hanging do a out. chemistry experiment. Yeah, they get to, to build it in, in China. Yeah. That's happening. Um, the Brooklyn thing's weird, right? Because yeah, what's up, with, what's up with the owner? Yeah, new owners. That That's good for them, though, mm-hmm. I think. But the whole... Just KD not being on the team next season, you have this whole free agent spending spree, but then nothing happens. But for every a year. single every single game they play is going to be shot through the filter of like, what does this mean for KD next season? Right? Is Karis Levert going to be a, a, a problem next season? <laughs> I think Carmelo has uh, has been in the mix for for Buzz Olympics. Oh yeah, just the amount of Carmelo content because oh, he like beat Randall and like a one on one. Did they, they have like a there video was of that. him and Julius there was, He's getting blackballed. Yeah. He made the rounds. He did the ESPN car wash. Um, there was rumors about KD and Kyrie wanted him on the nets. I think the amount of time we've spent talking about Carmelo compared to the m- basketball moments any of us can remember of his of the last five years is a little out of whack, right? Yeah. 2014 was his last really good season. And his last two NBA seasons were pretty rough. He should have been on Team USA. He, he actually, I, I think they would have We've been running plays for him. We've made the argument on the site before. It was like, should Carmelo just play for the Team USA and then like moonlights for some NBA teams? <laughs> right, and that's it. But essentially, it's just like an Olympic veteran. <laughs> He's basically the Leandro Barbosa <laughs> exactly, the USA not? team. The thing is, him on the Team USA and Marcus Smart also has this problem of they're fun to have unless it's like a one-point game with two minutes left because they will take the biggest shot. Yeah. Like they have to like keep Marcus Smart away from crunch time and in international basketball. <laughs> it's like he will shoot. He, he will also start an international. Incident. Right, he might start an international <laughs> incident too. But yeah, in the Australia game, he took the biggest shot of the game that they lost. The other thing I wanted to ask you about. So, did you see today? I think Bloomberg had this this idea that the NBA is going to make it easier for people to buy basically stock in teams. Oh, like minority, like make is going to reduce the the hurdles to becoming like a minority owner in teams. So here's my question. You you think it's time for me? Over the next 10 years, five years, who would you want to invest in most? Can't be the Celtics. I would want to be involved in the Seattle expansion team. Oh. Yeah. Good answer. Yeah. I'd like, like to be heavily involved. Think that's the next five years? Yeah. I think they go to 32 in the next five years for a variety of reasons. Because I, I do think it could help them replace 
some of the money that they would lose if they, if they reduced, reduced the, the amount of games. Yeah. So you go 32, you have, I guess you would have what, 18 conferences? Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sorry, 18 divisions, four 18 divisions. Everybody plays each other once or twice, once, once at home, one away. And then you play the other seven teams in your division once, 71 game schedule. And I like we're it. off. And they could replace all that money with like the t- 2 billion. What do you think? 2 billion for the expansion fee? Maybe more. Maybe they don't get TV rights for like five years. You do Seattle and Vegas. Yeah, didn't the Kansas City Royals just sell for like a billion dollars? I yeah. think they could probably do pretty well. Well, yeah. the Bro- Brooklyn was basically evaluated at over 2 bill. Yeah. So I, so Seattle would be my answer. What about you? I was trying to think about this because I I want to say Clippers and moving into the new building and the team that they could have over the next five years. But I was trying to be a little bit more creative. You know what I mean? Like I was trying to think of like a, like whether it's Memphis or, or like Hawks? counterintuitively going big on Oklahoma City or oh, something. Oh, wow. Buying low? <laughs> yeah. I, I just thought it was an interesting question though. It's like the idea of like, if you're a celebrity and you could buy into a team, you're a rich guy, you could buy into a team. What, who, who do you want to sit courtside at? Who do you oh, want to so be? So what do I get if I'm buying in? So courtside tickets. How much, how much, what's my stake? Like 2%? Yeah. Maybe, maybe the direct line, you have the cell phone of the GM just to be like, hey, not telling you how to do your job. Love what you're up to. Trust the process. But just look, maybe give this guy a call about this guy. But I think those guys end up becoming more of a nuisance than anything because <laughs> yeah, they're no like, <laughs> hey, my nephew was crunching some usage rate numbers. Yeah. And and then they're just like, uh, I think it's really hard to navigate all those dudes. But I think the benefits are the court sides and then getting to go. They all have like the little special club underneath yeah, before and the after games. Club, the commission yeah, club. Yeah, there's like a special, special section. And you get there. It's you and Matthew Perry. And then after two drinks, you tell people you own whoever the team is. They're yeah. not going to check you on it. They don't know who the <laughs> owner is. Like, I'm Chris Ryan. I own the Sixers. How we much? Know I own 1%. Yeah, it's relative. Ah. Yeah, it's like you got to adjust for inflation. <laughs> the Jay-Z thing was illuminating when he owned like such a tiny stake in Brooklyn. And he but it was got like so Jay, much mileage Jay, out of it. He got billboards. Yeah, Jay's and, an owner. Yeah. It's like, now he's owns like zero point. Would you put your excitement level at this upcoming season, like how high is it based on like compared to like the last three or four? Well, you've been here the whole decade, right? Yeah. So from an LA basketball standpoint, this is probably the peak, right? I don't think there's ever been this many good NBA players in one city since I guess Miami. But like, I mean, like we had the first second year of Grantland after the lockout. The first year of Grantland is like, we all have to get into college basketball. Right. And hockey. (laughs) Yeah. And then the lockout season, but they're coming out of that, heading into the 2012-13 season. That was when uh, Dwight Howard was on the Lakers with Nash. Lob City was in there. There was some excitement, but yeah. people were a little skeptical of the Lakers thing. Kobe was near the end. Dwight Howard was coming off surgery. This one is like, the, they have, might have two of the best five teams in the league. Mm-hmm. So, and definitely as you said, four of the best dudes. six players, four of the best seven players. Yeah. Yeah. Like four, at least four of the top nine, right? Yeah. You have Paul George. Where do you have him? Pretty high. Pretty high. Like nine, 10 range. Yeah. Eight, nine, 10. So, and you have that Clippers Lakers opening night game that I feel like is going to be like a real event. I, I don't remember tickets for hoops that were like a genuine that event. That feels like, like a title that. fight. That feels like yeah. a really, really exciting. Like it's just going to be obscene to see the people who show up for that. I think we'll get Nicholson wheel out for that, probably. Right? Wheeled out? What is he going to be like? Well, just a, I feel like he's the like Mac and me wheelchair. He's mummified most of the week, and then like gets woken up for a couple of Lakers games. You know, so I, he's definitely coming out for that. I think we could get DiCaprio. Well, it'll be like, does Gerard Butler get edged out? Gerard Butler. <laughs> he's he's a game. He loves to be in the mix. Gerard Butler. <laughs> Uh, it'll be interesting to see who tries to claim the Clippers. Like yeah. people that yeah. you're like, oh, I've always been a Clipper fan. Like, like this O'Shea Jackson it. Jr. is just like he, a huge Clippers fan. A couple, a lot of 25 This is the unders. opportunity to become part of the new Camelot. If you're an up and coming actor right now living in LA, yeah. you got to throw your flag down on the Clippers because you could be the Nicholson for the next 20 years. Especially if you feel like LeBron's heading toward yeah. a cliff. yeah. I do think I don't I don't think this will happen, but I can't be ruled out that this Lakers season is like a semi disaster. That's what makes it what so exciting. Think. 
That's what was I think it's like a one out of five chance this goes not great. Yeah, you think? Clippers would only go not great if also, there's injuries. Fun stuff. fact about the Lakers, I have I, I I work very seriously on the NBA coverage of this site. I've forgotten multiple times that Frank Vogel's the coach. Right. Multiple times. I'm like, man, when Jason Kidd's the coach, I'm like, wait a second. They fi- they actually did hire Vogel. Yeah. <laughs> He's gonna be ordering around Jason Kidd. Yeah. Um the other part of this Clipper Laker thing. You know, the fans have, the Clipper fans, there's not many. They're beaten down. There's definitely a little, you think you're better than me with the Laker <laughs> yeah. fans. And, but we've never really seen them at full powers on each side going at it. Yes. 06, it almost happened where they were almost in a playoff series. But I'm excited for that wrinkle too, because the Laker fans, they they don't even, it's like, whatever. You know, they don't even, won't even engage with the Clipper They're like, fans. What's Anthony Davis ever won? That's <laughs> actually the, a Laker fan at our company's take. Really? Yeah. Like, I don't know. Do we need him? What's he ever won? Oh my God. Yeah. That's what's happened when you've had so much su- the success that they've had. The, uh, I, I'm excited for some sort of animosity, but I'm not optimistic. I just think it's going to be pretty exciting. I think it could be, I, I, I think that in years past, the la- I, I got kind of like, locked in where it was like, well, the season doesn't really start until the playoffs because the Warriors are going to, it's going to be, even if the Warriors are the second seed and the, the amount of effort any Western conference team would have to expend to like edge out the Warriors for the number one seed almost makes it like a detriment going into the playoffs. But this year, I just feel like it's going to be like every week, the narratives are going to change. I feel like we're going to have, we're going to, we're going to have a lot of like fake champs over the course of the season. Yeah. People are going to get really fired up about a couple of fake teams you know, and I have no idea who's going to win the East. It's really, really cool. The Warriors thing kept us captive because it was always a situation where either you just said, well, the Warriors are going to win again. Or if you went the other way, it seemed like you were really desperately trying to make a case that you didn't totally believe. And if they weren't playing up to their potential, it just was upsetting. It's like, oh, really? You guys are the best. Come on, guys. But even if you... Can you try harder? If you we know you're around, better than It's everybody. like, if the Warriors... I guess Clay won't start the season probably. But like, if the Warriors start the seat, he's not gonna. He's gonna be gone until like April. Yeah. Well. Okay. So, but if the Warriors started out like fifteen and five, yeah. Like, wouldn't the hairs on the back of your neck stand up a little bit? If they can try to linger, and then there's like uh, when we get to January, they're talking about the whole uh, Clay's coming along. He's yeah. ahead of schedule. Yeah. I think that's a tough injury to come back from in less than 10, 11 months, but. um you know, and the Russell thing will be fun. It'll be, it'll be dazzling. Like to have to have those two just trading it off every night. I'm really starting to get excited. That's why I want to talk about Team USA because it, it was like my wife always says when one of her shows comes back, you know, like season three of whatever show, she's like, oh, my friends are back. And oh, like yeah. All the people on the show, like in Fleabag. So my friend's back. <laughs> I love her. That's how I felt watching the Team USA guys in this turkey game. I was like, oh. It's real basketball. Yeah. We're doing it. Yeah. I hate them. Yeah. Tatum has his weird beard. It hasn't even totally grown in yet. Kind of looks like a question mark. I would have been pretty into it if they had done rookies and sophomores. So like Trey Young's in it, people like that. For sure. Yeah. That would have been pretty good. I think it would have been fun. Um, we can watch you on, um, what's our succession show Number called? One Boys. Number One Boys. On Sundays after succession airs. After yeah. succession. Strong season. Yeah, strong. Um, you can say that again. Thanks, Chris Ryan. See ya.